will say, maybe murder, I heard voices, I heard 
I saw some faces looking like I have no idea. So Terry Anders. Spiritual. Okay. Uh, okay. I heard spiritual. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, <laughs> she said she looked it up. Okay. It's the study of salvation. Study of salvation. Uh, soterios has to do with salvation. Ology has to do with the study of. Uh, and so we have more of a responsibility than just addressing the afterlife. Uh, soteriology, doctrine of salvation, eschatology is what? <laughs> you know you got to study for it. Study for The study, doctrine, or teaching of the last days. Oh, yeah. uh, eschatos, last days. And so we have more work to do than just telling people how to die in peace. Amen. 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 If that's all we do, we are not doing what Christ did. Amen. Amen. Now I wanted us, and, and we, we got a list compiled, and we thank you for working with Sister Bailey, and we're going to take that list and over the next weeks and months, let our ministry start incorporating some things. We've actually started doing some of them, believe it or not, already. Amen. And you'll start seeing that there's some things on the list that was already in the works. Amen. And so it's coming together. But when we look at Luke chapter 4, Jesus, and we're, most of us will be familiar with the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Yeah. All right. He is tested of the devil. Yeah. Now, how many of you have ever been tested <laughs> of the devil? Now, interestingly enough, and here, here's why, if we only focus on soteriology and eschatology, we can start making the Bible a comic strip. Right. And when we make the Bible a comic strip, then the devil becomes this villain with a long tail and a pitchfork, and, and, and he's scary. But all of us, and certainly most of us, if not all of us, can say we've been tested of the devil. Yeah. But I don't think any of us would say we saw a pitchfork. We didn't see a long tail. We didn't see some ominous creature that scared us. If you did, it was probably because you were up too late watching TV. <laughs> But there are some commonalities every time the devil talks. Now, first of all, when we think of the devil, we must understand the devil, that word literally means the adversary. So when we put it in our comic strip language, it's easy for us to look for a pitchfork and a long tail. The reality is, whenever there is an adversarial force, it is a Greek word, Satanos, where we get Satan. It is an, a Satan, it is an adversary, it's the devil opposing us. And so, when we set out to do good, better vernacular is, when we set out to do God's will, and there's an adversarial force seeking to deter us or redirect us. That's the devil. 
Now, the devil has no new tricks. He's done the same thing that he's always done. Number one, the devil can't give you a terminal disease. If he could, all of us would be dead. I mean, just he ain't no dummy. So the moment you decide to go to Bible study, he kill you. If he had that much power. And literally, there was some historically who believed that. So they thought you could lose your salvation. And because they thought you could lose your salvation, they would want to die soon after baptism for fear that if they live, they're going to lose their salvation and the devil might kill them before they can get saved again. Now, that ain't salvation to me. It certainly is everlasting life. And so if he had that kind of ability, he would wipe all of us out. So if you're walking around afraid of the devil, thinking he might kill you, he might give you a disease, and the devil is trying to wipe you out, Stop fearing him. He can't do that. Now, what he can do, and what he always does, is tell terminological inexactitude. <laughs> and that's a fancy way of saying he's a liar. Now, since he is a liar, he is restricted in what he can do. Amen. Amen. So all he can do is lie. Amen. So how does he communicate? He communicates in one or two ways. Through other people mm -hmm. or through your perspective. All right. Now that, that alone, what I just said is enough uh, to compensate for the gas you spent coming out of here. <laughs> because he can speak through other people, whether it's somebody on your job, somebody in your house, or somebody on television. Help me somebody. Or he can speak through your perspective. Let me show you how the perspective works. Good things can happen. And you can have a bad perspective and it's still ruin your day. All right. All right. All right. Amen. So many ways it happens. Somebody can tell you tonight, you sure look nice tonight. Mm -hmm. Now that's a compliment. Mm -hmm. And on your way home, you think about it. Wait a minute. They said tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking in days past. <laughs> and a compliment when your perspective is negative can ruin your day. <laughs> and so we have minimal control over other people's words. Minimal. We have some, but minimal. But we have maximum control over our perspective. All right. So that when we step back and say, well, nothing but the devil, well, guess who could have resisted the devil? Because the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll do what? Flee. Flee. So here, when Jesus is tempted of the devil, this is what's happening. It is not some villain with a pitchfork and a long tail meeting Jesus on the mountain, and they're in this duo, duel. It is Jesus looking in this verse that we're talking about in verse 5. He's looking and he sees that he has an opportunity after viewing the kingdoms of this world, he has an opportunity to compromise his convictions to his father and become great according to the kingdoms of his world. Now again, that's powerful. 
that Jesus sees the kingdoms of this world. And, and you can just imagine what all comes with that. The wealth, the popularity, uh, the, the social status that comes with that. And Jesus knows, I see this. And while I see this, the voice in his mind is saying, you have this. How can you have it? Verse 6 says, all you got to do, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. Verse 7, if you will worship me, you have all of this. Wow. And so when the devil tests us or tempts us, what he does is he can't tempt us unless he offers us something. Right. And he shows us something that we can grasp if we compromise right. and do what he says. Right. And of course, many fall by the wayside yeah. because of what they see. Lust yeah. of the eyes, yeah. pride of life, yeah. the desire of the flesh. Yeah. You see it, it's within reach, or at least it appears to be. And if you just compromise, you can have it. And many say, you know what? I think I want it. <laughs> and so then when we get to verse 18, Jesus knowing what's entailed in the kingdoms of this world, he also knows that there are many who have been Restricted from receiving those things. In fact, they're not only restricted from receiving them, but those things are magnified at their expense. Yeah. And so now Jesus makes a choice between being a part of those things that come with the kingdoms of this world or sacrificing them to minister to those who are victims of those who magnify the things that come with the kingdom of this world. Now look at those things that he mentions. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now that doesn't sound like soteriology. <coughs> poor. Anybody here know anybody poor? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, I saw him today. Look in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Not only the poor, but to heal. Who is that? The broken heart. Not only that, but to preach deliverance to who? The captives. Those who are locked up. Not only that, but recover another sight to who? The blind. The blind. And to set at liberty them that are what? Bruised. Now, those are needs and issues that doesn't fit in our soteriological parameters. Because we basically just say, come to Jesus, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Ghost. God will take care of the rest. And Jesus is saying, no, I've got some good news to the poor. And I've got healing to the brokenhearted and deliverance to those that are captives and recovering of sight to those that are blind and liberty to them that are bruised. So those are the persons who make up our market. Now another Example of that, and I use this Sunday in my class, this, and I've used it before, but let's turn quickly to Matthew chapter 10. Actually, chapter 9, I won't get into chapter 10 uh, tonight, but chapter 9. And 
Once you found it, would you say amen? amen? Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. First, let's read that verse together. And villages teaching in their synagogues. Still not talking about soteriology. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing goes back to health, sickness, and disease. Verse 36, I want you to read that verse together. But when he saw the house of the Lord, he was moved with his actions on him. The cows they thanked and were scattered abroad, and she had no shepherd. So he saw a crowd of folk. I can picture that today. He was in the hood. And when he was in the hood, he saw a whole bunch of folk hanging out. But when he saw them, they didn't look too good. They were faded. Another word for that is they were debilitated. Tired. Scattered means they weren't getting along too well. They were as sheep having no shepherd. And here's what you and I probably say when we see that crowd. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and then we, we, we really want to be spiritual so then the next thing we say is we got to pray. <laughs> <laughs> but watch what Jesus says. Jesus says, Oh, look at all that potential. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Do y'all see that in the next verse? He right. says, The harvest show is plenty. Yes. Wow, look at all that. So the potential was what you and I typically call the problem. Right. Yeah. And then the problem is what you and I think is the solution. <laughs> he said the problem is not the harvest. The problem is the lack of labor. Yeah. Jesus said, look, when I see this crowd, I see them scattered, I see them debilitated, whoa, that's a plentiful harvest. That's the market. The problem is, ain't enough of us in here going out there. Now, here's why we don't go. A couple of reasons. But one of the reasons we don't go is because we tell them about John 3 and 16, and they don't get filled with the Holy Ghost when we tell them. So we conclude their hearts are hard. We told them. Even though we told them, they didn't rejoice. They didn't shout. Now, if they cry when we start telling them, we come back and say, God used us today. Because <laughs> we're waiting on them to have an emotional experience from soteriology. And they're saying, but I'm broke. <laughs> I was not even familiar with the story. You probably are with the uh, family who lost uh, nine people in Missouri. And, and, and one of the relatives of that family was someone that, that was a member of the church where I used to preach a revival. And they didn't want to talk long, but that basic question was, number one, will you pray? And secondly, Will you help me understand where God was in this? And that's a question many of us have. We don't, we don't broadcast it because we don't sound spiritual. But that's the question. And, and, and here's the issue. The Bible is not good at answering that question. The Bible does not major in answering why questions. Why does the heathen rage? Read the whole psalm. Ain't no answer. <laughs> psalm 22, and then Jesus says on Calvary, 
My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Read it all. Ain't no answer. Because the Bible doesn't major in answering why. The Bible majors in answering who. I don't know why it happened. But I do know he can help you through it since it has happened. And so here is what we're dealing with. Is that Jesus is saying, I, I've got good news for the poor, but the good news is not monetary wealth. But Jesus redefines poor. Mm -hmm. He redefines captive. He redefines everything. And so what he does in this Matthew 9 passage, he redefines. Matthew chapter 9, he says, the harvest is plenty. What we call the problem is the potential. The labor is being few. That's the problem. And then he redefines what we ought be praying about. It's one of those verses that if, if, if you're honest with it, you ain't going to like it. Because we say, pray for them. And Jesus said, no, you need to pray for y'all inside here. Yeah. <laughs> verse 38, just read that verse together. Matthew 9, 38. Pray, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will for the That's what we ought to be praying about. Not Lord, save them out there. Because mm -hmm. ain't but one way you're going to get saved. Yeah. It's by believing on the gospel. Yeah. And if the laborers aren't sharing the gospel, they have no gospel to hear, right. to believe in. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. And so we must pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, I'm sure you can guess, but even if you can't guess, it's in verse 37. Who was he talking to? His disciples. He told his disciples to pray. Now let's just glance at Matthew chapter 10 verse 5. And I want you to read part of that verse together. If you're ready to read, would you say amen? Amen. I want you to read. Okay. The ones he commanded to pray are the ones he sent for. Amen. Now again, that's why I say you really not going to like it. Because really what it's saying is if you ain't going, it's because you ain't been praying. Amen. Because those who pray, he sins. Amen. So, the market that Jesus says we all have are those who have been oppressed by those who profit to make up the glory of the kingdom of this world. So we ought to be consciously going out looking for those who are oppressed by those who are being taken advantage of by the kingdoms of this world. Now it becomes very critical because the kingdoms of this world look real good. And, and our culture makes sure that the kingdoms of this world look extremely good to us. See, there are things that, that, that we all do to make sure that we can say to the kingdoms of this world, y'all want to impress us. Mm. See, I know many of you don't get it, but one of the reasons why I wanted us to get the limo 
It's because celebrities love showing up in them all. <laughs> we watch that and like, ooh, look at that. But every member of this church got a limo. Amen. Now, if you don't appreciate it, that's you. Right. But you won't have to envy nobody. That there, there, there are places that have rooms like this, and they will charge you exorbitant prices to use their space. Amen. But as a member of this church, we got one. Amen. Right. Exercise room. Now, I got a membership to a gym. But as a member of this church, all of us got a gym. All right. Now, if we don't maximize it and make it all that it can be, that's our fault. That ain't God's fault. Amen. Amen. And here's what we'll do. People will not maximize what they have. Amen. And then go somewhere else and be talking about, ooh, this is so nice. <laughs> ooh, this is all. Oh. And, and here's what's crazy, y'all. There are people who will leave churches, not because of the gospel. They will leave churches because churches have certain things. Right. Like an exercise room. Right. Like a daycare. Yeah. They say, oh, it's so nice. And, and we have it here. It's just a matter of us maximizing it. Yeah. 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 Don't have somebody give you a motorcycle. You won't clean it up, put tires on it, and get it fixed. And then spend money you don't have buying a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Where they do that at? <laughs> you gotta invest in yourself. Yeah, man, man. Help me somebody. Yeah. You got to specialize in your area of specialty until it becomes special. Yeah. Somebody give you a bunch of lemons, you know what to do with them. Make you some lemonade. I'll turn around to my own by one of them. <laughs> and then leave your lemons going down the street to somebody's lemonade stand by lemonade. <clears throat> Make it look so good so that folk who don't even understand why you have it will turn around and say, you know what? I wish I had that. You've heard it said before, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. Amen. Take what you have and make it special so that others will say, you know what, that's a good idea. Why, I didn't think of it. One of the hardest things for me to deal with is when I get an idea sleep on the idea and then somebody else does it and it blows up. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> somebody said, that's me. <laughs> and so here's what we've got to look at. There are people who have no self-esteem because of what they don't have. All right. All right. Don't let the first and last time you get a limousine ride be when you in a casket. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I got a limo. I'm gonna take a ride. Where you going around the corner? <laughs> Roll the window down and wave it for me. This is my limo. And here's one thing that's great is when you can learn to be happy with little. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's one of the secrets to happiness, is if you can learn how to be happy with little. Now again, all of this is biblical. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have what I want. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I can take what I want. No, the Lord is my shepherd. My wants have been reduced. Amen. I can look at the kingdoms of this world and say, I don't even want it. And I don't need it. Power is when you are offered something that others want and you can turn it down if it would cause you to be distracted. Amen. And so Jesus says, verse 43, Say the kingdoms of this world. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to preach good news. Verse 43 says, I must preach the kingdom of God. Not the kingdoms of this world, but the kingdom of God. And so you know clearly that the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God are diametrically opposed. And so you can't preach the kingdom of God and be in the kingdoms of this world. So the kingdom of God appeals to those who are oppressed in the kingdoms of this world. And here's the good news. Good news, depending on how you look at it, that's the majority of people. Amen. The overwhelming majority of the wealth of this world is controlled by a few families. Amen. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Most of us are not basking in the joys of the kingdoms of this world. There's a huge market. The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. So for the next moments we have, before I give the invitation and benediction, we're going to do something we hadn't done in a while. It's called conversational prayer. Conversational prayer is uh, I'll open the prayer, I'll close the prayer. Uh, any person who wants to pray can chime in. Since it's a conversation, no one person needs to have a long prayer. Right. And secondly, if someone has already prayed what you prayed, it's not necessary that you repeat it. So we are entering into prayer with God as a conversation. Your prayer may be, be one sentence, and you may later come back and want to say something else so you can chime in so you don't have to get it all in the first time. Uh, but then at a certain point, I'll close it off. Uh, hopefully we have enough time to, to get a good conversational prayer going. But our prayer focus will be that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest. We're praying for ourselves Amen. to go out. Amen. As ministries, as individuals, as an overall congregation. Any questions before we start? Yes, and we just want to specify, Bell, that, that during this period, our prayer here is that the Lord would send forth laborers into the harvest. Yeah. I'll begin and let us bow our heads now. Oh God, our Father, through the preaching of the gospel, use me to be a laborer into the harvest. Father God, we're so grateful today for the opportunity to just be in your presence. I pray right now, God, that you would just help me to be committed to do your will. Lord, Father, thank you. help me to be thankful for living and grateful for little so that I can go out and do much and help others to accept what you have given us. Help me to labor for thee, O oh Lord. Yes. Father, thank you for your truth that you have given unto me that has transformed my life 
that I might be an instrument used by you to share the light of Jesus with others. God help me just to, not to just to be a hearer of your word, but a door also. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you to give me strength, strength in my mind and my body that I may be able to go forth. I pray right now, Father, that you will continue to give me the boldness to go out to witness to others. Allow me to stand on your faith, knowing that you're with me in every aspect of my life, Lord. I pray for continued boldness, continued willingness to do what you have me to do. Father, we thank you so much for giving us access to you. Yes. And through your word, telling us what our prayer concern should be. Yes. So Lord, as we conclude this period of corporate prayer, we commit to continuing this prayer even when we leave this place. We pray that as individuals, as ministries, as an entire congregation, we would be busy laboring into the harvest. Amen. We thank you for including us in what you're doing. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We stand together, the privilege of the church is extended.
doors of the church are open. If there's anyone here who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you desire to do so on this evening, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come for all things are now ready. If there's one who wants you to come candidate for baptism, let our Christian experience. The door is open. 